smartphone dings. I said, well, tell that smartphone to shut up. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so anyway, if I've ever awoken you on your smartphone at fourth in the morning, I apologize, but why weren't you up? Because <laughs> hey, I've got a regular life, that's why I told you. Then there's mine. <laughs> I, uh, for those who don't know me, uh, aren't you lucky? <laughs> but, uh, my name is Ted Johnston. I am a, a regional pastor for Grace Community International. I'm also the acting district pastor of this district. And um, my tenure doing that is just about over. I stepped in, as many of you have too, to uh, fill, try to fill some of the shoes that uh, Arnold Claussen wore. And uh, one of those was district pastor for a district that covered most of Texas. And I was already the regional pastor that included this district. So I've been wearing two hats. and. So I'll take one of them off here pretty soon. But uh, as part of that work, um, meant working to uh, find a new pastor for this congregation. And I want to thank all of you who've had such a big part to play in that. Uh, it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? <laughs> and we've been talking about that. We've certainly seen the hand of God in that, uh, in that transition in many, many ways. And uh, for that, we feel very blessed. I've always said, I, I, I borrowed this from somebody. I don't remember who I borrowed it from. So if anybody knows the source, let me know because I keep stealing it all the time. But <laughs> the saying goes like this. What the Lord anoints, we appoint. And I really like that sequence. <laughs> and uh, rather than appointing someone and hope the Lord actually did anoint them for that responsibility. Uh, but discerning who the Lord has anointed for certain responsibilities in the church uh, is an issue of discernment, spiritual discernment. And it's our belief that that discernment is best done in community. And it's not that we don't trust anybody to hear from the Lord individually, but as it says in Scripture, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I think it's in Proverbs there somewhere. And I think that's, that's very well and aptly said. And indeed, many of you have been part of that community of discernment, which is extended outside of, of this group as well, because... In Grace Communion International, that's our tribe is what I call it, <laughs> or denomination if you like that word. <laughs> but uh, uh, in, our, in our case, it's the denomination that appoints uh, the senior pastors in congregations. But we do so with the participation and the input of the receiving congregation, because after all, he or she is your pastor. <laughs> and. Um, so thank you for your participation in that process. Uh, thanks also very, very much to the interim pastoral team that has stood in the gap during this time. And I do, in that regard, want to give my special thanks to Ray, who is just up here, Skellinger. Uh, Doc Gibbs, who is uh, leading us in worship this morning. Don Lasher and Curtis Ray. And also, uh, though he wasn't officially part of the pastoral team, has been a tremendous help uh, to me personally, I know to all of you in this process, and that's your treasurer, Dick Bidlin. So would you all stand up and just, can we just thank them for what they have done? And we, we really should have their spouses stand up too, because we know who does the work. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but thank you, gentlemen and ladies as well. Very, very much. And we also, as we do this too, remember uh, the contribution of Arnold Kloss and, and, of course, Trish, who survives him. And I think, is Trish in San Diego now with her daughter? Yeah, yeah. so she's visiting out there. And uh, so we, we think of her very much today. And uh, remember Arnold, too. I think he would be very pleased. We, we'd actually talked about this transition process before he made it official. <laughs> I don't know if we should joke about such a thing as dying, but uh, hey, at my age, you start, you have to find some humor in it because it, you know, it's, it becomes more and more a possibility. Dick and I were talking about this. He picked me up at the airport and, uh, you know, you really, you, you really should be aware of the inevitability of death like from the first day you're born. But God in his mercy gives you, you know, he can, allows you to be in denial for about 60 years or, you know, or, or what, you know, whatever. Some people are still in denial at 80, and so God bless you, man, you know. <laughs> but uh, we're grateful for every day of life, and, and even more grateful at a certain point, aren't we? But uh, um, So I, I was mentioning that, uh, you know, Arnold and I had spoken about this issue of pastoral succession. Appropriately so, at a certain age, you do that. Uh, we've been having actually a shared discussion about that 
with, with also Bob Persky over in uh, the congregation that's over in Mesquite, and with Sonny Parsons, our congregation that's over in uh, Big Sandy, Texas, uh, sort of a cohort of guys about the same age, and I was the kid in the group, you know. <laughs> and, but we were talking about my succession, too, <laughs> so it's kind of like we were commiserating and uh, talking about, well, so it's probably time to start thinking about, you know, handing the baton over. And um, Arnold thought a lot about that as well and actually had had some conversations with a certain young man named Steve Solari about that. And, uh, and it's always good to, to think about that and prepare for that. And Bob Persky's doing that over in Mesquite and Sonny Parsons doing that over in Big Sandy. And I'm probably going to be doing a ceremony like this about three times in the next couple of months. So uh, just sort of all coming together simultaneously, not because it has to, it's just sort of the way it's working out. So, And I'm very grateful to God for all that he has done, including providing a younger people. Uh, you know, when I was Steve's age, if anybody called me young, I would have hit him. And I'm less violent now than I was in those days. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like... I always wanted to be older than I was until like about last year. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, but people who, who have been called by God, prepared by God, groomed by God, you know, our camp system that you just got a view of that one in Oklahoma City, and Pastor Mike Rasmussen was there on the chair talking. And by the way, he is my associate regional pastor, and he sends his greetings. Uh, he's likely to be the one most directly working with this congregation going forward, but we'll have more to say about that pretty soon. But um, anyway, he, he's here in spirit. He couldn't be here in body today, but uh, greetings from him as well. So thinking about all those things, the, the journey of preparation through the camp systems have come many young men and women who clearly had the call of God in their lives in pastoral ministry. Some of those have entered into our internship program. One one of the young men that you saw in that in that video is Joe Brannon. Uh, they actually had to move from Oklahoma City to da the Dallas area. They're now keyed into ministry in our Mesquite congregation. Joe's probably going to enter the internship program pretty soon. Um, you know, God keeps raising up new leaders, and I'm, I, I go like, wow. That's, that's cool. I mean, we've been working on it for like 40 years, but go like, that's cool, it's happening, <laughs> you know. Uh, but again, we have our part to play, but the Lord is the Lord of the harvest. <laughs> and all the credit goes to him. And so as I thank all of us, and appropriately so, I also give great thanks to him as well that brings us to this day. You know, in, in selecting Steve Solari to be the new senior pastor here, we have conducted a sort of our due diligence. We, we, at the human level, we do our part. And uh, he probably had no idea some of the parts he was going to be subjected to to get to this place. We, we don't try to make it hard on people, that's for sure. Uh, but we figure if they can survive the vetting process, they probably do fine as a pastor. So <laughs> That's not quite true, but it, sounds, it makes a good joke. But I do appreciate the uh, patience that Steve and Barbara, his wife, have, have shown in that process. And so that brings us here today. And Steve, uh, together with Barbara, and I've known both of them for some time. I actually met Barbara for the first time when, were you, were you a freshman when Tracy was? Yeah, she and, she and my daughter Tracy entered Ambassador College in Big Sandy on, on, in the same year and were dorm mates. So I met her as I helped my daughter unpack. And that was like five years ago. <laughs> Plus, you know. 30 or something, but anyway, <laughs> it, uh, so it, it's, it's a real treat to me. And I've known Steve, and, but especially his, his mother and his sister, f who are in New Hampshire for quite a long time as well. So. And then I've uh, run into Steve and Barb both uh, a lot in uh, Nashville, where they moved from here. So it's, it's really a, a, a real treat and a blessing to me to have a part in today what is the... Um, Installing of Steve as your new senior pastor. I love that term. It sounds like I'm a plumber. I am, here. I am the plumber. And, uh, but that's what, that's what it's traditionally called, so I won't change the tradition. But I, actually what I want to do is I want to preach to Steve now so you all can listen in if you want. Or take a nap if you prefer. But Actually, don't take a nap because actually what I'm going to talk about has applicability really to all of us. But there is a particular uh, gifted, gifting and there's a particular calling upon 
a man or a woman who enters into pastoral ministry. And I, I thought I would uh, remind Steve of what Peter said. That's, that's a pretty good authority on how to pastor. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure I'd want to have to walk in Peter's pastoral shoes, or sandals, I guess, in his case. Because um, that was a tough circumstance to be a servant of God in. And indeed, First Peter that he wrote, along with Second Peter, is principally about enduring through suffering. I thought that's a good thing to talk to Steve about. <laughs> he has no idea. No, no. We won't get morbid here. Actually, this is quite encouraging, but uh, I'm going to read this to you. You can look up on the screen. This is First Peter 5, verse 1 through 4, and I, I think it's an appropriate charge to pastors. In this case, he mentioned elders, and in, scripturally, elders and pastors are sort of synonymous. Synonymous. Elder is the ordained title, if you will. Pastor is the responsibility. So he says, To the elders among you, who these Christians he was writing to, these congregations, I, Peter, appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. And here comes the charge. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. The word of the Lord through Peter to Steve. <laughs> and to all elders... And I'm sure you'll see whatever your calling of service is within the body of Christ, really, to all of us. And Peter's charge, I think, if you, if you look at it, kind of has three parts to it. It involves the mindset and the method and the motive of leadership in the body of Christ. The mindset, the method, and the motive. Let me unpack each of those for you. Let's start with the mindset. Look at, at that passage. There's, there, are, there are two bookends. The first is Christ's sufferings. That's where it starts, and where it ends is the crown of glory. It's really important that pastors understand that that's the order it comes in. <laughs> By the way, that's true of all Christians. Uh, there are sadly a, a certain Christian theologies that think that what it's about is the crown of glory now, and that suffering is somehow a symbol of God's disfavor. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, and including the experience of about 99.9% .9 of all Christians in today's world today, and through the course of 2,000 years of Christian history, and, and certainly including those who serve in leadership in the body of Christ, is that they often do, they don't invite it, but they often do share in Christ's sufferings. We, we live in a time, at least for now, that you don't suffer a whole lot to be a Christian. I mean, there might be some anxiety, but you know, probably not a lot of you are going to be martyred today for the cause of Christ. But there are going to be a whole bunch of people elsewhere in this world today who shall be. And so I, I encourage congregations to always pray for the persecuted church, which is growing bigger and bigger as we speak. And indeed, many of those who are in leadership positions, the pastors, are the most vulnerable the, because they're the most uh, visible and often uh, are targeted specifically for martyrdom. And um, I don't want to get all morbid. I don't know that Steve is called to be a martyr. Uh, <clears throat> one never knows. We are in Dallas, after all. But anyway, <laughs> I had to say that. Roll Tide. No, I was, uh, you know, actually, I, I moved to. Uh, I'm going to get martyred before this thing's over. If I, don't know. <laughs> I moved to Alabama about two years ago from Northeast Ohio. You know, just before the Browns got Johnny Football, the savior of the Browns. Do you guys pay any attention to that anymore? Okay, I just wanted to know. I just just checking my Texas friends here because surely there's no joy in your professional football team. Here. But anyway. <laughs> He said, I'm never coming back. <laughs> I'm just going to lay it all out there. <laughs> but I spent a whole lot of years being a Browns fan and 
So I've been suffering for the cause of football, but I don't know if Jesus had much to do with it. Uh, but all kidding aside, um, it, the role of pastor is a role of sacrifice. There's no question about that. That, that sacrifice comes in many ways. I think some people think that, uh, you know, what do they do? After all, they preach on Sunday and play golf all week. And I suppose some do. Just none that I've ever known. <laughs> but I, maybe there's somebody out there. I think you guys know better. You've, you've had a marvelous example of a, of a servant who gave of himself sacrificially. And um, I believe that's also what your new pastor is as well. You know, when you think in terms of the sharing of, the, of Christ's sufferings, it's not like you're inviting that upon yourself, but to enter into the depth of his ministry pl places you in the place of suffering because you're sharing in the sufferings of other people. And I remember Paul's word where he says, you know, the, this worry about the church, you know, was, was very weighty on him. And he was a man of great faith. But there was that, there was that uh, sense of sharing in the sufferings of others. And when we share in the sufferings of others, we enter into Jesus' suffering because Jesus suffers with us when we suffer. That is the theology of the cross. Uh, appropriately understood through the reality of his death and resurrection and continuing incarnation that in his humanity Jesus still experiences suffering with us in fact Paul said we fill up the sufferings of Christ when we suffer and so the theology of the cross is really the essential basis of Christian leadership and um, I don't mean to scare people away from Christian leadership. That's not the point. But anybody who's been a faithful leader within the body of Christ knows that to be true. And that doesn't mean that, therefore, we should be counted, you know, like super Christians or something. That's not, that's not the point. But this is a charge to, to Steve. I know he knows this. And Peter leads with that reality. Christ's sufferings and the sacrifice that comes. That sacrifice includes sacrifices of time, of finances, of sacrificing to include your family in the ministry. Uh, that speaks to Barbara's participation. She's entering, entering into this world eyes wide open and willingly, and I appreciate that, Barbara. Um, this is just part of what it's about. But also keep in mind, Steve and Barbara, that there is in this ministry much joy. Um, because joy and suffering are not contradictory at all. Sacrifice and joy are not mutually exclusive. And so a strong message in Peter's letter is to be patient while suffering for well-doing. And he says that to all Christians, not just those who are leaders. But it is a good advice for an elder. Um, for a pastor, there is no self-promoting health and wealth stuff. But entering into ministry with Jesus, who is the ultimate suffering servant. So, Steve, let that mindset, which is in Christ, be the mindset that is in you. Start well, serve well, and finish well. I don't think I'll be around when you finish. At least I hope not. <laughs> A, I don't want to live that long. B, I want your ministry to be very long. So, God bless you in it. Secondly, Peter gets into the method of leadership. Uh, he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. There's sort of a two-fold role there, or two-fold method of pastoral leadership that to some people can seem contradictory. A shepherd on one hand, that sort of speaks to the nurturing, caring side, and the overseer on the other, which speaks to the mean shepherd, who's not really a shepherd, but a sheriff's side. Well, that's how some people look at it. And, and by the way, those two ideals are at odds with one another. But for Peter, they weren't at odds at all. They are complementary and, in fact, essential. Because they go together. First of all, he says, be a shepherd. The word, the word shepherd in this respect, is used as a metaphor. It's meant, it's meant to conjure up an image. And in that culture, you know, out here in the Wild West, shepherd doesn't 
conjure up the kind of image we're looking for. <laughs> I, used to, I used to live in, uh, in western Colorado where we had the range wars between the cattle guys and the sheep guys, you know. And I must tell you, shepherds were not looked upon highly by the cattle guys, and I know that's true down here too. Uh, but in that culture, a shepherd was kind of marveled at because it was a 24-7, almost like a lifetime commitment of giving yourself sacrificially for the care of the sheep that were looked at as beloved. Shepherds knew their sheep by name. They knew their shepherd, the sheep did. They also knew his smell and he theirs. Don't take that metaphor too far. <laughs> but it's, it speaks to an intimacy of, of knowing and of caring and of nurturing and protecting because the shepherd, a principal role of a shepherd in that culture was to literally protect the sheep from wolves or other varmints, you know. Where I live still and where I used to live in Colorado is mostly coyotes. Uh, in that culture, if you go back far enough, it was actually lions, although they eventually got cleared out of the Middle East pretty much, and it was more like wolves and hyenas and other kinds of varmints. But the danger to the sheep was very great, and the shepherd was known principally as the protector and the one who gave nurture, the one who led the sheep into good pasture and got them out of the bad stuff. <laughs> And would do so at, at his own risk sometimes. And sometimes even moving the sheep when they didn't want to go. And the sheep are going like, well, you're not acting like a shepherd now. I, do, I want to stay here and drink this foul water. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's just a little, little word to the sheep. Sometimes the shepherd has to lead where you don't want to go. But they do so out of love, not out of some power trip. The word that Peter uses here for shepherd, interestingly enough, is the same word that Jesus used when he said to Peter at that morning on the beach, remember that one? Shepherd my sheep, or feed my sheep as it's usually translated, the same word. Be a shepherd, Peter. Um, I forgive you for, for <laughs> betraying me was the implication. Now let's get to work. And your work is to shepherd my people feed my sheep. So that's a huge part of the method and expounding on that Peter then says not lording it over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock and indeed a faithful elder who serves as a shepherd leads principally by example. You know words can be helpful. Um there are certain tools that are in their toolkit that can be helpful, but there is, no, there is no tool that is more helpful, more appropriate, especially when you're talking about the shepherding role, than personal example. So Steve, be a shepherd, be tender, watchful, be like the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus. And as you do so, and hear this all of us, keep in mind who the chief shepherd is. All of us as ministers, we're under shepherds. <laughs> That's no small task, though. It's a very important one, but we serve the great and the chief shepherd. And then Peter also says, not only be a shepherd, elders who serve as pastors, but be an overseer. And the idea there is sort of diligent, watchful oversight. Um, it really speaks to the issue of an involved leader, of one who's active, who's constantly in the middle of the people, but not, doesn't necessarily stay right where they are, often has to go out ahead to kind of chart out the territory. <laughs> I often tell pastors, do that, just don't get so many hills ahead that they can't see you anymore. <laughs> That's sort of a word of caution, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm preaching myself now because, as my wife said, I married a fast horse. <laughs> And I can get like about 25 hills in front of you without any trouble. It's not because you're so slow. It's just that I tend to go fast. That's not good. So I don't know about Steve, but I'm, I'm talking to me now. Don't get too far ahead, but 
an overseer must get out in front and must be seen and involved in that way and to chart the course and to constantly be on watchful guard. That's what it means to be an overseer. There's another aspect uh, that Peter doesn't address specifically here, but it's kind of, to me, a sort of part of this overseer kind of role that Paul speaks to. Uh, so you can keep that up there, but uh, if you have a Bible handy, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Sort of drooping here. There we go. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. And just breaking into the thought uh, of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, it says, He, speaking of Jesus, Ephesians 4.10, He who descended, that's Jesus, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. That's the great sort of cosmic Christ in his ascension, in his glorification. And that same one, that same glorious, ascended, cosmic Jesus, you know, who seems like so lofty, he is involved here. And this is one way he's involved. It was he who gave some, in speaking of the church, to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And pastors and teachers seem, tend, seems to be, in the Greek construction, one office. Pastor slash teacher. Because <laughs> pastors typically are teachers, although not all teachers are pastors. But anyway, it's often referred to as this fourfold office of leadership. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So Jesus makes that available to the church. He is involved in make what the Lord anoints. We, we are then called to appoint. And his anointing role is a very active one through the Holy Spirit. But why, why those offices? Why, why those different roles of leadership in the church? Verse 12 tells us to prepare, and uh, I think as the King James translates that, equip, God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all, or as you say here, all all (laughs) y'all. I just love that part right there. Um, Until we all reach unity in the faith. We're not there yet. (laughs) That's that's been a 2,000 year struggle. Till we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, Steve be a shepherd. Steve be an overseer who is an equipper. (laughs) Uh, I see that equipping role as a sort of a subset of the oversight role. To be an equipper, to uh, help to see that the, the, the people of God in your care and oversight are equipped for the things that they have been gifted to do, the calling that they have on their lives within the body of Christ, with an eye toward the whole body maturing into the fullness of Christ. And it does, as Paul says elsewhere, it takes every part of the body. And part of it is to see that every part of the body grows in maturity to participate in the way that they're called to participate. That's no small challenge, by the way. Easy for me to say, and then I'll go, I'll leave. <laughs> I said, you just take care of that, Steve, and I'll check back in in 10 years. We'll see how it went. <laughs> but I know, I know his commitment to doing that, and I know his experience in it, and, uh, and I know what you've already experienced here. So much of what I'm saying is just keep on keeping on now with Steve's leadership. To be an equipper does not mean to sort of fax in information from afar. It means to get actively, personally involved, to live relationally within the community. Jesus said, as I've already mentioned, that the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. And once again, much of the equipping, like much of the other influencing of leadership, comes through personal example. One of the things I, I encourage pastors to do, all leaders of any, of any stripe, is just include other people in what you're doing. That's how they get equipped. And that's, we call that mentoring in today's world. In Jesus' world, they called it apprenticing. 
Uh, they actually call it discipling in his world because that's what rabbis did with their, their protégés. Jesus said to a bunch of young kids, basically, y'all want to take a road trip? That was sort of a modern paraphrase. <laughs> they had no idea where that road was going to take them. Maybe like three, three and a half years of just walking everywhere with Jesus and being equipped by his example and by his inviting them into participating in stuff for which they were not ready. And when they messed up, sort of debriefing, going like, well, that was, that was really bad, wasn't it? But don't worry, you'll get it better next time. Jesus was, Jesus was a risk-taking leader. I'm not that way. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I like everything certain and predictable. <laughs> Actually, I don't, but it makes a good joke. But I'm not... I do not have nearly the tolerance for risk that Jesus has. So i got to say, Lord, help me. You want this person to do what? And he says, yeah, Ted, have some faith in me. <laughs> and I've learned, I guess I've grown in that, re that regard over the years, and I've seen the Holy Spirit do amazing things in the, peop in the lives of people who seemingly were absolutely unprepared to do it. And I think you can all, probably all relate to that, too. So that's part of the equipping that pastors are called to do. One last thing, too, because I'll just tag this on. It, it goes in here somewhere. And I love this. Paul says this, speaking really to leaders. Be helpers, speaking of who they lead, be helpers of their joy. I, I just, I, Dick and I were talking about this coming over. Right? There ought to be a little fun here, don't you think, Dick? <laughs> it's like, the older I get, the more I like that right there. <laughs> So there ought to be a little fun in this. But there is great fun. I like the word, the biblical word would be joy, I suppose. Um, in actively sharing in what Jesus is doing. And you may suffer because of it, but it's still fun. Um, the fun usually comes after the suffering ends. Then you, you know, then you can talk about it around the campfire. But uh, You with me on that? I, clearly you're with me on that or you wouldn't be sitting here. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Steve, for your commitment to that. Also, with regard to this issue of method, of being examples to the flock, as to be an, a shepherd and an overseer, again, I emphasize that Peter says, do not lord it over those you lead. I'm not emphasizing that because I think that you know Steve is, is likely to do that. That's not my point. It's just that I know that some of the challenges of being a pastor can lead you in that direction, even unwittingly. And I say that to all of you because many of you here are in leadership positions. And I think it's a constant battle not to do that because leaders have authority. And it's easy to slip into using that authority in a way that you become more of a lord than a shepherd. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Jesus clearly shows by his own example that we are not to lead through power. But also, we are not to move in the opposite direction of abdicating responsibility. So it's, it's not like there's only two choices. Beat people up or ignore them. <laughs> you know, um, But that's what you see so often in this world. And in the leadership examples often that they're seen. Sadly, sometimes in the church. Instead, the way of Jesus is to develop kind of a rhythm of leading that is shepherd-like and includes those characteristics of an overseer but is involved relationally with people and influences, which is what leadership is, right? Leadership is what fundamentally what? Influence. In ways that are loving but are direct and meaningful. So that's the method. So we talked about the mindset We've talked about the method, and I'm now going to the third point because somebody needs to get the kids. <laughs> Do you remember that? See? What a mind I have to remember that. Okay. <laughs> the method, the mindset, now, lastly, the motive. Peter speaks to that this way. He says, you know, do these things. Be, be a shepherd. Be an overseer. Take on this responsibility, fulfill this responsibility, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. And not because you're greedy for money. 
Uh, there's no danger of that in our fellowship. <laughs> well, you can be greedy for money, it's just your greed will shall not be fulfilled. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, not greedy for money. By the way, that's not a complaint about what I'm paid. That's not the point. It's just that uh, we are a very small denomination with pretty limited resources. And most of our pastors, I don't know if you know this, but the vast majority of our pastors are what we call bivocational. They're not paid to do what they do uh, at all. And I, I'm not ragging on Steve that he's going to actually be employed. And he won't actually be employed 100% of his time. He'll have sort of like what Paul would say, a little tent making going on the side. Which is great. Uh, actually, there's some great advantages to that because the tent making part sticks you out in the community part. So there's actually some, some real significant advantages to that. But whatever the, whatever the arrangement, uh, he speaks to the issue of motive. Do it because you want to. Now, some people have a problem with that because, like, well, you shouldn't want to be a pastor. That's kind of like self promotion. Well, that's another problem. But I'll tell you what, I can tell you this from personal experience. When the Lord gets a hold of you and calls you to be a pastor, you want to do it so badly, it hurts. It makes no sense on paper, <laughs> you know, for many of us. But that's all right, because that's not what it's about. So to desire the office of an elder is, as Paul said, is to desire a good thing. Because the motive is right. And you do it not because you must, not out of some, some sense of being a compulsion or a wrong kind of obligation, but because you are willing. And not greedy, is, you know, no motive that way, but out of an eagerness to serve. And I, I am so grateful because I supervise a whole bunch of pastors in one form or another and work with many others as an equipper, and is to see that motive so clearly evident among our pastors. And that, I'll tell you what, that's a beautiful thing. That's a gift from God. Uh, it was not always that way in our movement. To, I'm not saying everybody had different motives than that, but uh, from what I see these days, that is the motive. If it weren't, they wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and I, I thank God for that. And I thank God for Steve's motive in that way. So Steve, your service as pastor is not to be offered for any of these self-serving reasons that Peter says no, but rather is to be offered with a willing heart that eagerly wants to serve the Lord by pastoring this people. And this people, by the way, extends right out into the street. For indeed, in, a, in many respects, a pastor is called to not only pastor the flock that has been gathered, but those part of the flock that have not yet been gathered. In fact, Jesus, giving the example, said, I'm not willing to leave the 99 in, in, in appropriate care, but go after the one. Uh, and, and that, of course, is part of the calling and also sometimes part of the suffering because that those are tough calls to make sometimes. But the Lord will lead. Fundamentally, and above all, the motive for serving as a pastor must be love for Christ and love for people. The two great commandments. Love for God. Love for people. So Steve, let God's Spirit through His presence and His written word define your ministry. So I'm done with Steve. <laughs> Until I talk to him on the phone because I'll be, I'm going to have the blessing of continuing to sort of mentor him probably through the end of this year and then Mike Rasmussen is going to pick it up from there. Because I will have taught Steve everything I know. It takes about 10 minutes. I don't got that much. <laughs> but we, we like to have multiple voices speak into a person's life. And I'm grateful for Mike's willingness to do that. But I will say this. And uh, Barbara, I, it's not about trying to get you for free you now. <laughs> it's like you get two for the price of one. That's what you do. So I'm really cautious about that. But I, I'll say this now because I know Barbara, I know her sense of, of also calling to really a couple that serves together in this kind of ministry. Um, you are gaining a pastoral couple. Um, be careful about what that means. And be careful to give Barbara space to be who she is in Christ. So I don't want to embarrass Barbara because I didn't tell her I was going to say that. Uh, and it's not like I'm all worried about you guys in that way. But I think it's just good to be reminded of that, in part because of our history, uh, which was 
Well, I don't need to go into that. <laughs> Several of you have been around long enough, you remember. Uh, but the point, the point is, is that she has a calling on her life. Her calling, obviously, is with her husband in many respects, but actually how she lives that out, I suspect she'll have to figure out over time. So give her space to do that. And allow her to offer her spiritual gifts back to the congregation as the Lord calls her and defines that for her specifically. Okay? I'm going to ask you some more questions, congregation, in a minute. And if you say no, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> but I already, we sort of already asked you, you know. So I've, we've been here before and had some of these discussions. And so this is kind of a making official what we've already done unofficially. But I'd like to ask Steve and Barbara to come forward if they would. And also all the elders that are present with us today, including Pastor Lee Berger here, who drove in from the, the vast wastelands of East Texas. I get up at 4 30. You didn't get up at 4 30? I know. Oh, well. <laughs> I don't normally fly out at 4 30, I said, I don't. I want you to understand. So, um,. We want to ask Steve a couple of questions. He's already given me the answers, so no surprises, please. <laughs> but uh, this is this is this is um, consequential. It is appropriate that it be done in the presence of of those who are part of the congregation that Steve will now pastor as senior pastor, working with a team of pastors, including some of the, some of the guys standing right here now. Uh, and many other leaders, men and women both. And I thank you all for that. But Steve, it has become apparent to the folks in what we call church administration and development. We are, we are a team that is responsible for working with our pastors, for recruiting and preparing pastors and other things along those lines. And it has become apparent to us and also to uh, those here in your congregation, including the, the, the gentleman who has served as the interim pastoral care team, and the congregation at large through the surveying that we've done, that Jesus Christ has indeed called you through the Holy Spirit to the office of senior pastor of Hope Community Fellowship, which is a congregation of Grace Communion International. So Steve, do you agree to faithfully and humbly serve the people of Hope Community Fellowship in the office of senior pastor with Christ's help in the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and in accord with your denominational supervisors to uphold the responsibilities and duties of that office. I do. And Hope Community Fellowship, this is for all of you. Will you, as members of this congregation, faithfully support Steve, pray for him, and uphold him in the name of Jesus Christ in his office here of senior pastor. We, do. we will. All right. <laughs> By the way, thank you very much for that because I, I've been around a few years and I know what that means. And it's very, very much valued. In accord with uh, so often the example in Scripture is the commissioning of a leader, whether it would have been a king in Israel or, or other types of leadership, um, I'm going to anoint Steve with oil and ask the elders to join me in laying hands on him as we, uh, as we pray a prayer of commissioning. I usually pour this all over a person, but, <laughs> but not today. Steve, why don't you come on up here and... Uh, the rest of you guys will sort of gather around if you would. Barbara, you come too. Steve, I anoint you with this oil as a representation of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit who is indeed the one who gifts the church with leadership, who calls people to ministry, who equips them, and in that way anoints them. And so what the Lord, the Holy Spirit has anointed, we do appoint. We do so, Lord God, in prayer. We acknowledge that you are indeed our God, and we are so grateful for that. We thank you for the grace that you have given us in so many respects, but above all in your Son, who is grace itself. 
the Lord Jesus, your Son, Father, that you sent into this world as a sacrifice for us all. And we thank you for the truth that Jesus is and the life that he continues to live as one of us on our behalf, as our high priest who takes prayers like these through the power of the Holy Spirit and Father lifts them up to you and does so in words that are perfect. And we join in the prayers now of our elder brother Jesus through the power of the Spirit and the presence and testimony of all the angels in heaven. Rejoicing at this moment of consecration, of setting aside for an office, in this case for Steve Solari, being appointed, Lord, to the office of senior pastor of this congregation, and also, Lord, with a special calling to this community as well. Lord, we pray that you will give him a supernatural degree of discernment to see you at work here and out there and to understand how to participate personally, but especially to lead the people of this congregation in the work that you're doing. A work, Lord, that blesses us all, for indeed to have a part in what Jesus is doing is a rich personal reward, and then it is a blessing that echoes out and touches the lives of many. And I pray that that multiplication will occur, not for the sake of numbers, Lord, but for the sake of grace. And for the sake of seeing people come to know the God who loves them unconditionally. And the spirit who calls them to be followers of Jesus and, and to join in what he is doing for the sake of the world. Lord, thank you for the mission that you have in this world. And I do now anoint Steve and lay hands as elders upon him to this office. We acknowledge, Lord God, that he is your servant. And together we acknowledge what you have done to give him this office, to call him to it. Thank you for all that you've done to make that calling possible, the ways that you have shown it and confirmed it. And we lift him up to you, Father. We do at the same time ask a special blessing on Barbara uh, as she stands with Steve and in her own right ministers at his side and with him and in ways that you have yet to define for her. So Lord, bless them both as a couple and we do thank you so much for them. And we pray this prayer, Lord, of consecration. And we do it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, it's a great pleasure <laughs> and a privilege to present this pastoral couple, your new senior pastor, Steve Solari and his wife, Barbara. Steve, the lectern is yours. <laughs> and Barbara, too, if she'd like. Yeah. You know, I thought about what to say this day, like for the past six months, and, and yet I still draw a blank all morning long. And I just, uh, I, I just want you to know that it, it's been an amazing journey for us because um, we both really believe in teaching and in practicing listening to God and uh, I think that's something that all of us do on a daily basis and it's so thrilling and so humbling and so amazing when God speaks clearly to you and uh, I think that this whole process has been something that Ted mentioned a few times it has been something that's just so clear I mean it's as if I mean, the burning bush, you know, seems about equivalent to what we've gone through. It's just like from every direction there's been confirmation that, you know, we're, we're to be here together, all of us here, here now. I mean, and it's just, a, I, it blows my mind and it's just amazing and humbling and I, I really feel like God's going to do something big in the colony and I'm just glad he invited us to, to be here, to be with you guys, to experience it. So we already love you guys. We feel like we know you. I mean, we've only been here physically once, but we keep up on email and Facebook and prayer requests and all that stuff. So, I mean, it's just, it, supernatural is the word for it. I mean, it's, it's just, you guys are already family to us and we love you so thank you so much now that you're official both of you <laughs> we now have the keys to the kingdom no to the building <laughs> and we want to present these to you 
you get to pick which one you want. You know, if you don't like that one, you swap with your wife. But thank you. We really appreciate it.